Hi, good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting in 2024 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. We have received an apology today from Tim Eagle, MSP, and in his place can I welcome Alexander Stewart, MSP. And I would like to remind everyone to please switch off or put to silent mobile phones and electronic devices. So the first item of business is a declaration of interests. Uh, in accordance with Section 3 of the Code of Conduct, I invite Alexander Stewart, MSP, to declare any interests relevant to the remit of the committee. Thank you and good morning, convener. Delighted to be here, but I have no relevant information to uh, give the committee at this stage. Okay, thank you very much, for that, Alexander, and welcome to the committee. The next item of business is to decide whether to take items 7 and 8 in private. Is the committee content to take these items in private? Yeah. Under agenda item number 3, we are taking evidence on the Judicial Factors Scotland Bill. Uh, can I welcome Patrick Leyden KC, TD, the former Lead Commissioner, and Charles Garland, the Interim Chief Executive of the Scottish Law Commission. Uh, welcome to the committee, gents. Uh, can I remind the attendees that to, first of all, not to worry about turning on the microphones during the session, uh, as these are controlled by broadcasting. And also, uh, if you'd like to come in on any question, please just can raise your hand to catch my eye uh, or indicate to the clerks, and it will bring you in. So before we move to questions, can I invite Patrick to make some brief opening remarks? Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Uh, it's some time since I retired from working as a Scottish Law Commissioner and I'm privileged to be allowed to appear here today to represent the Commission. We welcome the decision of the Scottish Government to bring forward legislation to implement the Commission's report on judicial factors. The subject is one which exemplifies the rationale for the existence of the Commission. It's an area of law of continuing value to the citizens of Scotland. It is in need of reform, and it is not politically sensitive. It is precisely the kind of topic which the Commission is ideally placed to address. Judicial factors are a homegrown institution developed to deal with a continuing need, that is, the holding, administration and protection of property where it is not possible, practical or sensible for those responsible for the property to carry out those functions. Before the Union with England, Appointments of judicial factors were made by legislation of the Scots Parliament, by the Scottish Privy Council and by the Court of Session. After the Union, appointments were made by the Court of Session, which also made it acts of sederunt to regulate the institution. Acts of sederunt uh, are a form of subordinate legislation, nowadays generally limited to uh, regulating court procedure. Formerly, they had a wider remit. It is recorded that in the 1750s, the court made an act of sederunt requiring striking Edinburgh brewers to return to work, demonstrating that then as now, the court had its finger on the capital's pulse. The Scottish Law Commission did some work on judicial factors in the 1970s, culminating in a report on the powers of judicial factors, which was produced in 1980. The subject was put on the Commission's agenda again in 1990, but work was interrupted by other projects, including references from the Government. A discussion paper was, however, published in 2010. In the light of the responses to the proposals and questions in that paper, the Commission prepared a final report with a draft bill, which was submitted to the Scottish Government in 2013. I should perhaps say that, as a rule, the Scottish Law Commission seeks to reflect consultees' knowledge and expertise in formulating its proposals. Where the views of those consulted tend in a particular direction, the Commission itself will normally move in that direction in its report and any attached draft legislation. The current bill largely follows the Commission's recommendations. Some changes have been made following the Scottish Government's separate consultation and developments in drafting practices have led to some stylistic alterations. But the general thrust and content of the legislation are as recommended by the Commission. Broadly, the Bill does not seek to regulate every aspect of the operation of judicial factories. Rather, it seeks to establish the parameters within which a well-established and successful institution can operate better at the present 
and to develop further in the future. It extends the jurisdiction of the Sheriff Court so that the jurisdiction of that court and of the Court of Session is broadly concurrent. It leaves in place the discretion of the Court of Session to take account of future contingencies so that if circumstances arise which have not occurred previously, but where it would be appropriate, appropriate to appoint a judicial factor, then that can be done without difficulty. On behalf of the Scottish Law Commission, I have great pleasure in commending the bill to this committee. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Layden. And so, uh, my opening question you've already answered. <laughs> so, but, uh, but one thing actually just, I will uh, just ask as, a, as an opener for the, the committee. Um, with regards to the, the bill, uh, although the bill, uh, as you indicated, there are some, uh, some changes uh, in contrast to the, the report from, well, the draft bill from the, the Scottish Law Commission. Um, so, are you content that, um, that the bill? Uh, still um, has the has the ethos and the and the wider considerations. Uh, yes. The SLC's work. Yes, it's very very recognisably. It's, it's the same piece of legislation. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Alexander. Thank you, convener. Good, good morning. Uh, I've got a number of questions. I'm going to go through with you. Uh, two organisations that responded to the committee's consultation, Missing People and the Law Society, have said that the bill could have done more to address the needs of families where people go missing. In what ways do you consider the group during the policy development of the proposals? And can you highlight any parts of the bill which you think will improve the situation for these families? That's my first question. The, um, the bill, the legislation, will enable the appointment of a judicial factor um, wherever that's required. Um, if somebody has gone missing and has enough property for anyone to, to require administration, then it will be competent to apply to appoint a judicial factor to look after that property. Um, so the, the, the bill works and the, the, the family of somebody who's missing, the family of, well, we'll just stick with that example, the family of somebody who has gone missing would be able to ask for a judicial factor to be appointed to look after that property. Um, as I read the concerns from the missing persons uh, um, evidence, written evidence, they are worried about the, um, the procedure that might have to be gone through, yep. about the cost of going to court, about the, um, the technical requirements which might get in the way of ordinary folk just going along and getting somebody appointed. That is not something which can be addressed in the primary legislation. It can be addressed by the way in which the Act, as it will then be, is advertised. It could be addressed in guidance given, say, to citizens' advice bureaus so that um, information about how to get to the court and appoint a judicial factor could be um, disseminated. And it could be addressed by providing for a court procedure which would enable folk who are not legally qualified to make the appropriate application. Nothing in the legislation will prevent that, um, but as the missing persons organisation themselves say, one of the things you've got to take account of is that if somebody has gone missing and somebody else is appointed as his judicial factor, there is a risk mm -hmm. that the property involved may not be used as it should be. And, that is one of the things which the legislation addresses. Does that answer yeah. your question? Thank you. The, following on from that, the Charity Law Association has also said the bill pays little regard to the role of judicial factors in the charity sector. Uh, how would you respond to the policy concerns and can you highlight the parts of the bill which you think show that the charitable sector have not been overlooked in this process? They haven't been overlooked in the sense that the um, Charities Act expressly provides for the appointment of a judicial factor uh, to the affairs of a charity. Um, but I am conscious that in the functions conferred on judicial factors, on the powers that they have and the duties they have, which are all rolled up as functions in the uh, government's bill, 
there is nothing said about a continuing duty to distribute property. And of course, it may well be that a charity to which a judicial factor is appointed has enough money to carry on operating as a charity um, and a continuing duty or discretion to distribute money to the proposed beneficiaries of the charity. And there's nothing expressly in the judicial factors legislation which deals with that. Mm -hmm. So it may be, and there's one other difficulty, um, there's one other difficulty about intimation to those interested in the estate. And if it's a charity with a wide remit, then that might be quite a lot of people. Mm. And intimation to, to each of them would be impossible. So it may be that the particular requirements of a judicial factory in relation to a charity may justify the inclusion of specific provision in sections 3, 15, 27 and schedule 1. Um, so if, I mean, I, I, I take the point, the charities people will no doubt make it themselves and at the end of the process, the, the government will be able to say what, what they're proposing to do about those concerns for what it's worth. Um, they do seem to me to be legitimate concerns yeah. and um, th there would be a way of addressing them. Okay. Thank you. And in relation to information gathering powers in both section 12 and 39 of the bill, there is an exception for the requirements to comply. This is for the UK government ministers, departments and bodies exercising uh, functions such as HMRC and they can choose whether to comply. This may go we want really for the Scottish Government to answer, but can you explain the rationale for those exceptions? And separately, what policy impact do you think the exceptions will have in practice? The rationale is that um, the Scottish Parliament can't impose duties on UK government departments. That's a matter of the Scotland Act. Um, I myself would not have thought it would make any practical difference to the operation of the legislation. Um, there are court decrees and requests for information and administrative cooperation going on at all levels mm -hmm. between uh, relevant authorities in Scotland and the rest of the UK. And the uh, provision of information to a, a judicial factor appointed by a sheriff court or, a, or the court of session in Scotland is not going to be met with any difficulties. I, I, don't, I don't see it as a practical problem. It's one that has to be worked round because of the structure of the devolution settlement, but it is not something which will, in my view, cause any practical difficulties. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, no, thank you, Alexander. Uh, so just before we, we move on, um, certainly in this particular uh, question, this area, um, would a, uh, and, a, and I hesitate to, to ask this question, would a Section 104 order uh, be of use in this regard? Yes. No. Right. Yes, we, we, um, you'll find it, it was covered in the, in the, um, in the Commission's report, mm -hmm. and we've put in a draft, a draft Section 104 order was prepared and no doubt you know, life will have moved on and what will eventually be produced will not be the same as what's at the tail end of the report, but something along those lines will be put in place, yes. Okay. At least that was the government's intention. At the... sure. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you. Um, so move on to Section 4 uh, of the Bill. Uh, under, under the section, the main qualification required to be appointed as a judicial factor is that the court considers a person uh, quote, suitable for that role. Uh, in response to the committee's call for views, some respondents, such as missing people, supported this approach. Others wanted the bill to be more prescriptive. Uh, Property Mark, for example, wanted professional qualifications to be specified. Uh, did the Commission consider uh, an approach which uh, would involve specifying in statute that professional qualifications are required for some circumstances where judicial factors are appointed, but not others? I think we did, but I'm thinking back uh, 14 years now, so I'm not going to, not going to swear to it. But um, as I said in my opening statement, 
we are providing a general structure, a general framework for the appointment and operation of the judicial factors. I think it's a matter of horses for courses. If, as is normally the case, you're administering um, an estate with quite a lot of money in it and quite a lot of legal ramifications, it would be appropriate to have a solicitor appointed. There will be other cases, um, perhaps if, as apparently frequently happens, you get a husband and wife who are uh, partners in, in a farming business, they, they run a farm and they uh, fall out and they cannot bring themselves to agree to even the sensible decisions to keep the farm going, then a judicial factor in, in a case like that would ideally be a farmer, somebody who could make those decisions and carry them out and make it work. And a legal qualification would be singularly um, out of place. So the, the, the legislation enables the court to take account of the circumstances of the particular estate and to appoint a, a, an appropriate person to deal with it. And I don't think it would be sensible to, to go further than that. I know that the, the um, estate agents, I think, were putting in a plea for and a mention, a mention specifically of estate agents, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't have done that. The court has the power to appoint the person who's best qualified, and I think it's sufficient to leave it at that. OK, no, thank you. Um, certainly, other evidence that we did receive um, that came in from the Faculty of Procurators of Caith Ness, um, they, in their submission, suggested, uh, in a quote, that we are firmly of the view that whatever other provisions may, may, may be made, the judicial factor should be wholly independent of the Law Society of Scotland and there should be explicit prohibition of any current officer or employee of the Law Society of Scotland being appointed as the judicial factor. Um, do you agree with uh, their suggestion and no. their comments? Um, unless, uh, unless you were... No. <laughs> I, I... The, the Law Society has a duty to make sure that uh, solicitors act properly in the interests of their clients. And as I understand it, but they will be able to tell you when they come and give evidence, as I understand it, it is only where a solicitor's affairs are getting into such a state of confusion that they have fears for their, his client, their client's um, money that they will intervene. And they have to do that, I suppose they would say, regrettably often. Not very often, but more than they would like. Um, it seemed to me personally, when I was talking it over with the Law Society, because we had consultation, we had meetings with um, the Law Society in particular, um, that having a solicitor on staff who could act as judicial factor in a range of cases was a very sensible way forward. Um, unless, well, I have the disadvantage of not having read any, anything more that the Faculty of Procurators of Caith Ness said, they may have had a bad experience up in Caith Ness, I don't know. But um, from my perspective, from the Commission's perspective, the arrangements which the Law Society have put in place seem to be eminently sensible. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, and just one final question um, in this area. Um, so, uh, you'll be aware of the, the situation that happened with uh, McClure's solicitors, uh, I would imagine? Um, no. No, no. There were a firm based in Greenock, they had 14 offices UK-wide, uh, and the, the firm into liquidation in 2021. Um, was certainly, the, the discussions I've had with a, a range of constituents, um, and also uh, individuals from the, the legal, uh, legal fraternity who have reached out to me. Uh, there was one question that's been put consistently, and that was why the Law Society wouldn't have instigated a judicial factor uh, in the situation to deal with McClure's. Uh, McClure's had estimated 19,000 uh, individuals with trusts, uh, about 63,000 wills, and uh, run about over 20,000 uh, powers of attorney. So they certainly had a, a lot of uh, clients. And so the question has been put consistently, uh, why wasn't a judicial factor uh, introduced? I have asked, I've met the Law Society, and they've given me an explanation uh, as to why uh, one wasn't. 
uh, and, and I think the explanation was uh, certainly did seem to be very fair and also rational. Uh, but uh, and certainly in the circumstances uh, that the, that I've just outlined, uh, Buddha, uh, and in your uh, past experience, uh, would a judicial factor be uh, something that would have been worth considering uh, in that regard? It is certainly the kind of case where an application for the appointment of a judicial factor could competently be made, but I really am not in a position to second guess the rationale or otherwise of what the Law Society decided. You're, you've, you've spoken to them about it. You're in a better position than I am to judge it. All I can do is sure. hope that we've set up a system which would enable the appointment to be made in appropriate cases. From what you say, that sounds like an appropriate case, but every case has its own features which make it difficult to, to advise about. Sure. No problem. No, thank you. Um, Yes. Thank you, Oliver. Hi, thank you, Kavira. I just wanted to follow up on that and what you were saying before. I mean, obviously you said you know, it, it doesn't happen you know, all the time, but regrettably often the kind of law society is in the position of, you know, of, of having to, to step in or put a judicial factor in place. And I just wondered, um, you know, off the back of McClure's, but also other cases, whether there's a kind of conflict that you see between the law society regulating the work of solicitors you know, and also putting putting a factor in place to kind of take over when when something goes wrong, you know, and whether that was something you know something that was considered you know in, in how this bill was was drafted because obviously it seeks to kind of consolidate the law, uh, but there are obviously still a number of other uh, pieces of legislation on the statute book that give the power to appoint a judicial factor in specific circumstances, and it's just whether there was a thought to bring it all into this legislation and why why you kind of didn't um, and, and kind of secondly whether you know there are still some sort of situations as a result of that where it's it's not as clear as it could be you know sort of the, the exact responsibilities when it comes to, to appointing a judicial factor. There is always a tension I'm speaking now about the the practical business of setting out legislation there's always a tension about where is the best place to put a provision. This bill gives general provision about judicial factors. Um, you're absolutely right. There are a number of other bits of the law where judicial, effect, judicial factors are allowed to be appointed. We've talked about charities in the 2005 Act. The Law Society has a power to do it under the 1980 Solicitor Scotland Act. The reason we didn't take them out of those provisions and bring them into our bill is because they're sufficiently separate that if you were trying to find out what happened when solicitors don't act properly, the place you would look to find that is in the Solicitor Scotland Act 1980, because that is the code for solicitors. If you're looking for whether or not you appoint, whether or not a judicial factor could be appointed to a charity, you'd like to find it in the Charity and Trustees Investment Act, Scotland Act 2005. That's the logical place to look for it. And so we left them there. As, in, um, as I, again, I'm sure you know, in relation to proceeds of crime, there are people who are appointed to, to look after the estate, look after the property which has been confiscated pending a court decision, and they are, they look very like, all but the name, judicial factors. The people who put that legislation together decided to put their administrator of property into their legislation rather than hark back to judicial factors. Um, so, as, as a matter of legislative policy, legal policy, the government will say, let's put it all in one place, and as a matter of drafting practice, as a matter of drafting discretion, the draftsman will say, well, we will amend the Solicitor Scotland Act to take account of this out of the other, but we won't take the provisions out of there and put them, put them in our bill, because that is the sensible place to leave them. I'm not sure whether that answers your question. Uh, you know, it's, it certainly starts to answer it. So I guess for clarity, where you've left provisions untouched in other legislation and just made minor amendments to reference this legislation, the Commission was broadly happy with how those 
those those provisions in other legislation operate at the moment? Because there would have been a chance through this to, to potentially amend some of those if if, if well, there had been a policy reason for doing so. No, you, I, I, um, I apologise. I may have missed the first part of your question, which was was there a possibility of a conflict of interest in the Solicitors Scotland Act and the way in which solicitors are responsible for um, supervising the operation of individual solicitors and also appointing judicial factors um, to, to look after them. And it may be that what was behind your question was that the solicitors administrative body, whatever they call it at the moment, the Council of the Law Society, was not keen on appointing judicial factors because it looks bad for the profession. I'm paraphrasing, I'm sort of yeah. making it a general kind of, general kind of statement. Um, and there is always, I suppose, a general feeling that the people who run a particular profession are perhaps not the best people to look into possible defects in the operation. And um, the, the great safeguard that you have in relation to solicitors is that the Law Society has an interest in making sure that solicitors operate properly. They also have an interest in looking after the wider interests of the profession because if a solicitor defaults and his clients lose money, all the other solicitors have to contribute to making that up. And so the existence of the Solicitors Guarantee Fund, if you like, ensures that the appropriate bodies in the Law Society are not over-influenced by the um, reputational damage which might be done to the profession if individuals are um, taken out of practice and a judicial fact that is appointed. Yep. That's a very crude way of um, putting no, it. But that's, that's helpful. I'm just, what, what I was really wondering is, are you happy? Where, where there are these provisions for appointing judicial factors in other legislation, you've looked at you've looked at those as as the commission the commission's looked at we, those. We looked at them, and, and you're broadly happy with them because obviously this bill would have been a chance. Yes, it to would. Kind of change it, them. We could have we could have taken them out and put them in our bill and, and change and change them, modified them. No, well, we, we might or might not have modified them yeah. because the the policy in the 1980 Act is for the 1980 Act. Um, we wouldn't have changed that without widening our, our scope quite a lot, because that's a matter of the regulation of solicitors, not the regulation of judicial factors. Okay. But we could certainly have taken the provisions out of the 1980 Act and put them into our bill. But for the reasons I've tried to explain, we didn't, didn't do that. I know that's, that, that, that's helpful. So you felt those, changing those policies and other legislations out of scope <coughs> for, the, for this bill, we wouldn't it would have widened it no, beyond that would have, your that would have, we, we would have We would have thought that was beyond our scope. Yeah, beyond the scope of the project. No, that's helpful. Thank you. OK. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. And uh, Bill Kidd. Yes, thank you very much, Convener. Um, thank you for your, uh, for your responses today. They've been very helpful. Um, can I ask um, that in Section 5 of the Judicial Factors Bill, um, bill it would abolish the requirement to find cation? Yes save in exceptional circumstances. Yes. One policy justification for this is that when a professional is appointed as a judicial factor, they will have professional indemnity insurance. But then, in response to your discussion paper in 2010, the accountant of court said that she thought the scope of accountants' professional indemnity insurance might not be as broad as is generally thought and it actually might not cover embezzlement by accountants. Um, can I ask, um, if, you, if you remember that, but can I ask, if, um, did the Commission resolve this concern when uh, it was raised when developing your policy on Section 5, please? Um, I know that's taken it back a bit there, but... Um, so. The change that Section 5 makes mm -hmm. is in relaxing the requirement to find cation. Previously, uh, at present, at present, it is a requirement in every case for the judicial factor to find cation. Mm, yeah. It's a guarantee that he or she will not, or if he or she does default with the money, or may, um, th th there will be somebody else to pick up the bill. There's insurance policy to pick up the bill. Cation is, I'm told, it's 
it's not difficult to get, but it costs money. And so the expense is something that you would try to avoid if it's at all possible. And so the, um, the absolute requirement has been changed into a discretionary matter for the court. Right. Um, I have absolutely no idea what um, the accountant's concerns about professional indemnity insurance for, for accountants um, has on the finding of cash in inappropriate cases. Right. So I, I can't help you with that. I, I, I know why Section 5 says what it says, right. um, but it had nothing to do with the, from my recollection, it had nothing to do with the professional indemnity insurance for accountants. Well, that, that's something we can maybe... But the accountant will no doubt be able to tell you what, what the concerns were, her, her concerns were. OK. Well, that would be useful. Thank you very much. Perhaps we can maybe delve a bit deeper on, on that basis. But in response, and uh, staying on, Cation, um, in response to the committee's call for views, the University of Aberdeen and R3 said they thought the threshold for requiring Cation in Section 5 is actually too high now um, and do you have any comments on that for example does the phrase exceptional circumstances fit with the general policy desire to make judicial factors a solution for the families with missing relatives if you see the link in there so. as the missing persons people said it is possible that in a family situation um, you might feel it was actually very desirable for whoever was appointed as a judicial factor to find um, to find cation because uh, they may not be the professionals who are operating a judicial factory in a disinterested and arm's length manner they have much more of an it's possible that they might have much more of an interest and so it is possible that those are the circumstances which m might make it desirable to consider the um, requirement to find cation um, I, I really can't say every case every case will be different and yes. um, the, the court appointing the judicial factor will have to take all these things, all the, all the circumstances, into account. Right. Um, but the, 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 the intention was to make it less routine to require judicial factors to find cation. Whether exceptional circumstances um, are, is the right test is a matter, of, matter for judgment. So that the government will be able to explain their thinking on the matter when when they come along to give evidence. Okay, well that's useful as well. Thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Oliver Mandel. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, part two of the bill uh, proposes various powers and duties for a judicial factor um, in response uh, to the committee's call for views. The Faculty of Advocates said it would be desirable uh, to give the judicial factor additional powers to seek directions from the appointing court. Um, this would be used, for example, in the event of a dispute or uncertainty about what steps the factor should take. Um, is this something uh, the Commission would like to comment on as a policy idea? Um, There is a power in Section 11 which enables the court to um, withdraw or retain or keep back from a particular appointment some of the functions set out in the legislation. And there is a power in Section 11 for the person concerned, the factor concerned, to go to the court and ask for additional powers. Um, I didn't quite understand what point the faculty was making. I think, I, well, I, I think from the submission, what they're saying is there are circumstances in which someone could be appointed, and then there could be a dispute about how they, how they, how, how they carry out their functions, and that it may be helpful for that uh, individual to, to be able to go back to the court 
um, and, and seek kind of clarification that what they were doing was was in order um, and was consistent, I guess, with the powers that that, that, that they've been appointed to appointed to to, to use. I'm still not entirely sure that I've grasped the, the essence of what the, the faculty's concern is. It's, it's something I, can, I would think the committee can take up with the faculty and we're likely to, to hear from them and then we could perhaps, I, I, I think that would you know, be... perhaps send you further, uh, you know, further detail of that and then have the, the chance to, to comment then. Um, you see, at the moment, at the, moment the um, a factor who is in some doubt about whether or not what he's doing, what she is doing, is um, within the functions that have been conferred, would discuss the matter with the accountant of court. If it was some positive action which was in question, something he was going to do, then he can go to the court and ask for an extra power to do that. Um, but the aim of Schedule 1 was to set out in very general terms a very wide range of powers. Um, and it's always been possible for judicial factors to go back to the court and say, does this mean I can also do X? Um, and indeed, one of the reasons for putting all the powers into Schedule 1 was to stop people having to go back to the court and saying, can I do X? X is now in Schedule 1. Um, but there may still be cases where things have to happen which aren't um, envisaged uh, in Schedule 1, and you can go back to the court and, and fix that. Otherwise, the fact that it's appointed to make decisions, and the, the court has frequently emphasised that they are not going to authorise the factor to do this out of the other. They, they expect the factor to use his own discretion, and they will, um, you might say, well, we're not going, to, not going to stop you doing this. Whether you do it or not is your business. Because that's the point about judicial factors. That's what makes them a, a, a sort of unique office. It is the fact that they are being appointed to exercise a discretion under control, under supervision, but nevertheless to exercise a discretion. No, I, think, I think that is helpful and that probably speaks to the policy intent as, as, as uh, things are currently, currently drafted. Um, I also wanted uh, to ask about section 19 of the bill, uh, which covers the investment power of a judicial factor in respect of the estate. Um, and following the approach in the Trust and Succession Scotland Act 2014, I wondered if it should be made clear on the face of the legislation that a judicial factor uh, could choose uh, environmental, social uh, and uh, governance investments, even if these might not lead uh, to uh, maximum income for the estate. That was a change the committee had recommended in our, our report on, on that legislation, kind of reflecting, kind of changing thinking, um, you know, certainly uh, on, on environmental, social and governance issues. Would that be an amendment to section 17 that you would be after then? Um, I think it'd be in, in, I think that would probably be in section 19, but I mean, that would be up to, to kind of a drafting colleagues and probably in, in 17, I think. I 17 is 17. about investment and yeah. 19 is... Sorry, I've... Is is section 17, sorry, apologies, I'm yeah. in the wrong section. Um, the duty of the factor is not to uh, give effect to the government's views on appropriate investment. The duty of the factor is to maintain the estate for the ultimate benefit of those who are entitled to it. Um, if I were a factor, I would be very cautious about taking into account considerations other than the general um, financial um, parameters within which investment takes place. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess, for example, it could be that factor was 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 put in place, and they were they were thinking about the the kind of reputation of of, of the of the organisation, and it might be that in strict financial terms, you could get a 
a better return on investment by going with option one, uh, but, but option two uh, might, might produce a, a lower short-term return, you know, but would be more consistent with the organisation's kind of values, wider public image. You know, and it, that, 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 that was kind of what we were, I guess that was the sort of scenario we were thinking about in relation to the, the trust and succession. The, um, I think the factor would be taking a risk. How, far, how much of a risk he's prepared to take is a matter for him. But at the end of the day, I don't see what answer he would have if somebody said option A would have produced a 10% return, you chose option B, which produces a 5% return, you should account to us for the missing 5%. And the fact I guess that it, that's why we're asking about whether it should be on the face of the bill that they've got the... Well, that's a matter of policy. At yeah. the moment, the, the fact that is there, the, the object of appointing a factor is for him to um, maintain the estate and generally manage it properly in the interests of the ultimate beneficiary. If, if, you, if the policy were to require a factor to do something other than that, I think it would have to be very clearly stated in the legislation. So you wouldn't think it was appropriate in this case? I, I'm not for me to say whether it's appropriate in this case. I'm not, okay. not responsible for the policy. What the, the bill does is, uh, is consistent with a duty on the factor to maintain the estate in financial um, real terms for the benefit of the ultimate beneficiary. That's the uh, limit of the office at the present. If, if if there is a, a policy that the factor should be doing something else, something more, something less, then that would need to be very carefully thought through and drafted. Okay. But whether it gets drafted is a matter for Parliament. As somebody once said, bills are made to pass as razors are, razors are made to sell. Thank you. So, so Charles, did you want to come in? Uh, just, uh, thank you, Kavina. Just uh, add... Uh, a small comment that um, judicial factories uh, will, generally speaking, have a different time scale than, than uh, trusts. Uh, many trusts will be set up for the long term, at least for the medium term. Um, and so the importance of the ESG option, if you like, um, may be more uh, of an issue than in a judicial factory where the, the, the primary interest is in holding and administering and then giving back um, if, if, if that can be possible the, uh, the, the, the estate so it may be that it's, uh, it, it, it takes slightly less of a, of a focal position um, although I, I know that some judicial factories do end up um, staying in place for, for a very long time well, that's, that's helpful, thank you well, well, just before you continue so just following on from that point then uh, Charles uh, if, uh, if there was a judicial factor in place for you know, a long period of time, um, would this bill, as it currently stands, provide them then with that flexibility? Uh, notwithstanding also the question that Oliver asked regarding the, uh, the ESG, um, uh, but would the bill provide them with that flexibility to consider uh, other, uh, other investments, or other way to invest? Uh, or uh, the question Oliver asked with regards to should uh, an amendment come forward to provide the ESG, would that then be helpful in that regard? Uh, as, I, um, <clears throat> as I understand it, the, 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 the bill as it stands doesn't have the, uh, certainly not the express uh, powers that, that are now in the uh, Trust and Succession Scotland Act. Um, whether they whether they would be appropriate um, is, 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 is another issue. The, the, the Schedule 1 has uh, a long list of, 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 of different powers. Um, it might be unusual, I suppose, for a judicial factory to be uh, anticipated uh, at the outset to last for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, the case I have in mind was one which was uh, submitted in evidence to the commission um, a number of years ago and was a farming uh, judicial factory uh, which uh, was still in place I think 25 years after it had first been put in but uh, I, I, there was no evidence that there was any intention that that uh, 
was how it was going to go at the outset, um, in which case uh, these ESG investment powers might might be better suited for, for at least medium or longer term um, uh, funds. Is, is, but I, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on it. But there may be that that, that uh, anticipated timescale of a digital factory as opposed to a trust might be uh, an issue as to the relevance of, of that so, power. So, so just so I have a final question on this. So just out of interest, um, that one example, uh, the 25 years, it clearly is a, a long period of time. Uh, I don't think anyone would have anticipated uh, that length of time. Um, but do you have any, any figures uh, to hand in terms of you know, the average length of time that a judicial factory would be, uh, would be in place? If you don't... I, I, uh, I, I don't, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, no, I don't. Okay. That's something we can, we can look into that. Yeah, the accountant of court would be able to tell you definitively what the average length was, I imagine. Okay. Good. That would be very helpful and we could consider that further. Thank you. Oliver? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, academics from the University of Aberdeen and Aberdeen University, as well as R3, have all said that the fiduciary nature of the judicial factors' duties needs to be spelled out explicitly um, in legislation. Um, and Professor uh, Greer also thought there needs to be a clear statement as to the legal remedies uh, if there's a breach of those duties. Um, what does the Commission have a view um, on, on this? Um, we said very clearly in our uh, report that the uh, essence of the institution was that it was fiduciary. Um, that was based on several court decisions. The courts considered it uh, frequently, initially in relation to whether or not a factor could charge professional fees for doing legal work on behalf of the estate, and the answer was no, he couldn't, because it would give him a conflict of interest between his duty as factor and his, his, professional, um, his professional position. It, is self, it was, to our mind, a self-evident feature of the institution that it is fiduciary and so it wasn't necessary to say precisely what that meant in the in the in the legislation um, do you think it do you think it would be easy to to set out what that meant in legislation or do you think that's do you think that is it would that be a difficult task It would be very easy to say this is this this is fiduciary, but what does what does fiduciary mean in particular cases yeah. is more difficult. And unless you have a clear idea of where it's going to lead you, it's in my view better to leave it as a general uh, understood principle, but without trying to tease out exactly what it might mean in, in individual cases, because if you tease out what it means in five or six individual cases some intelligent person will come along and say, ah, but what about case seven? You haven't covered that, and therefore perhaps it doesn't extend to case seven. If you leave it as a general principle, the courts know what they think it means at present, and if they decide to change that in the future in the, in the light of further uh, change in circumstances, they will be able to do that without having to wrestle their way around a, an unfortunate phrase in a, an act of parliament. Well, thank you for that. Um, in response to the committee's call for views of the Law Society um, in relation to Section 15, and I hope my notes are right here, um, the uh, duty to make a management plan uh, and Section 16, the duty to submit accounts to the accountant of court, um, it thought that the requirements of the bill were more prescriptive, so the opposite, uh, the opposite challenge uh, than in relation to the Commission's draft bill. Um, do, you, do you think that the, 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 the bill we see now is, is more prescriptive than, than what the Commission had in mind? Um, I haven't looked at that particular aspect. If there are changes between what we suggested and what the Government has decided to implement, those changes will have been informed by considerations uh, within Government, and you will have to ask them what effect they thought they were having 
and what the policy was for making those changes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Convener. <coughs> I've got a couple of questions for you. <coughs> the Faculty of Advocates and the Sheriffs and Summary Sheriffs uh, Association have both said that Section 23 of the Bill <coughs> could be modified. This would be to deal with exceptional circumstance when a judicial factor had acted unreasonably but not neglect, uh, negligently in relation to the litigation and so could be found personally liable for legal cost. Does the Commission have any comments on the current policy and drafting of Section 23? Before a judicial factor started or became involved in litigation, he would certainly consult the accountant of court and he would certainly take separate professional legal advice as to the prospects of winning or losing or, or the desirability of fighting the case. Um, it is still possible that having taken that advice and acted in accordance with it, he might be found at the end of the day, or he might be thought at the end of the day to have acted unreasonably. Um, I imagine that very many people who get involved in litigation and lose wonder why they did it and whether it was actually worth it. It's the decision you make when you start whether or not it's desirable to make a factor personally liable for a decision at the end of the day that he's acted unreasonably, even though he went through all the correct uh, advice-taking procedures, um, is a matter of policy. But it would have the effect that a judicial factor might be more reluctant than is desirable to defend the interests of the factory estate in litigation because he's too concerned, legitimately concerned, about his personal liabilities if the litigation turns out badly. And so you could do it. You could say, if you were subsequently found to have acted unreasonably, we are going to make you personally liable for the costs of this litigation. Um, but it would be a great uh, disincentive to the, to the factor to start the process. Now, whether or not you want to impo impo impose that disincentive is a, is a matter of policy. I think, I thought, we thought at the time that the balance we had here was correct. If a factor acts improperly, then the court can make him uh, find the money out of his own, out of his own resources. But um, a factor who's acting in good faith and taking the proper advice and doing what he thinks is best in the interests of the estate um, ought not, according to this legislation, ought not to be um, penalised if somebody says at the end of the day, well, we think that was unreasonable. It is reasonable to consider litigation. It is reasonable to consult the accountant. It is reasonable to take outside advice. And if the outside advice and the accountant's advice are all that this is a, a reasonable thing to do, it is quite difficult to say, well, but we're going to come along later and, and do you for the expenses if you, if you get it wrong, if the court decides the, the litigation against you, which is what it comes to. And people who try and predict what courts are going to decide um, are intense with crystal balls. Thank you. Uh, my next question is, um, Section 34 of the bill sets out the rule that discharges usually uh, frees the judicial factor from liability as a factor under civil law. 
Section 38 of the bill requires the accountant of court to re report the court where uh, serious misconduct or other material failures are found. The court then has to uh, discretion to dispose of the matter as it considers ap uh, appropriate. For the benefit of the committee, what is the uh, Commission's understanding of the interrelationships between the two provisions? Does the Commission think that any drafting changes are required to improve clarity? The, um, they deal with different different things uh, in in terms of in terms of timing. It may be that section thirty eight would come into place uh, into play before section thirty four. If the accountant thinks that a factor is doing something which is seriously wrong, misconduct. Um, the accountant will report to the court and the court will take such action as it thinks appropriate. A fact, uh, sorry, and a, if the accountant thought that a factor had been engaging in that sort of action, there would be no question of her granting a discharge to the factor. The misconduct and the consequences of it would be an open question which would have to be resolved before you could consider granting the factor a discharge. That is an entirely separate exercise from saying that where the accountant has considered the factor's final accounts and final report and has discharged the factor, that that should be the end of the matter. Um, the factor must have finality, and the finality comes from the accountant's inspection of his proceedings during the factory, um, the accountant's acceptance after audit of the final accounts and the accountant's decision that the factor can be legitimately discharged. Once that's happened, there has been an adequate process to, to sort out the rights and wrongs or the, the, any, any uh, questions about how the factor has acted and he's been discharged. You should then be able to say, right, that's all behind me, I've done that, I will carry on with life without people coming along later and saying, ah, but we don't think you should have done this three years ago. That's how I read the relationship between the two sections, and that's what we were intending to do, and I think it's what we've achieved. Do you think, sorry, uh, no. uh, anything needs to be done to find the clarity or just to clarify things? Um, I don't, but I'm always willing to be persuaded if the, um, if, if somebody out there if these uh, g gentlemen and ladies from Aberdeen think that there's clarification required, then they should say so. And I'm sure that the, the government will always be willing to listen to ways of clarifying the, the legislation. But I don't, I mean, the, either of the sections may not be um, perfectly drafted in itself, although I haven't heard of any suggested defects, but um, that's always an open question for the, for, the, for the draftsman. Could I have got it better? Thank you. Okay, no, thank you. And Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, convener. Um, this is a question about um, a role which you've covered, your, not by yourself, but you've covered speaking uh, here um, quite a wee bit this morning, the accountant of court. And um, <coughs> There seems to be differentiation uh, between um, not quite so much the role, but who and how qualified that or those people are, that person is. Uh, in relation to sections 35 and 36 of the Bill, the Law Society has commented on what it regards as a significant departure from the Commission's draft bill and uh, considered a watering down of the level of legal and accountancy knowledge required for the roles of the accountant and the deputy accountant. And in the SLC's draft bill, there were to be 
uh, they were to be knowledgeable in matters of law and accounting. However, in the current draft, they must be, in the opinion of the uh, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, appropriately qualified or experienced in law and accounting. And the policy memorandum to the bill makes it clear that formal qualifications are not necessarily required. Um, so what's the Commission think about that sort of approach to sections 35 and 36? And uh, do you share the Law Society's concerns over these differentiations? The provision we produced required the accountant to be qualified, as you say. Right. The um, position in the bill is a lower qualification in uh, formal terms. Uh, and I think you would have to ask the government why they had changed that and what their thinking was. Mm -hmm. Our thinking is in the report and the draft bill that we produced. Mm -hmm. And I would say that was the appropriate thing to do, because right. that's what we said in the report. Uh, if the government wants to change it, then mm -hmm. that is a question for them, and you would have to take it up with them. Sure. Do you think that the government, when it's formulating this approach, uh, may, well, it will look at what you've said, um, but do you think they might approach you to get further clarification on what you're <coughs> looking for? Because there does seem to be a bit of a, a, a differentiation there, shall we say, at least. Um, I think our approach and our views are sufficiently set out in our report, and I would not expect them to come back and say, do you really mean that? <laughs> Right. Okay. No, that's, that's fair enough. It's just that, um, because there is such a, an element of divergence there, I just wasn't 100 percent sure. Maybe it's not as, as as wide or anything as has been presented, but there will be discussion over that. You know, somebody who is appropriately qualified or experienced in law and accounting would cover somebody who has all the qualifications that right. anyone might want. Mm -hmm. um, but he might also be a person who, without those formal qualifications, is also uh, thoroughly up to speed right. on the, the various requirements, uh, practical requirements of the of the position. Well, that, I, uh, yeah, sorry. No, I think that's quite clear then, actually. But just in reading it, um, it didn't... No, it, it, it's, certainly a, it's certainly a difference in, if this is the Law Society's point, in terms of the formal qualification, yep. whether that is absolutely uh, critical is a matter of judgment. In this case, the judgment of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Faisal Chowdhury. Uh, thank you. Very much. Uh, normally, the Scottish Le Legal Compliance Commission, the SLCC, acts as a gatekeeper for all complaints about the uh, solicitors in Scotland. Uh, although a complaint about conduct may be referred back to the law society to determine of its substance. With section 38 of the bill, which places a, a duty of the accountants to uh, report misconduct or failure of a judicial factor to their professional body, is there a potential policy issue with A, uh, bypassing the usual role of the SLCC and be applying different uh, threshold for referral to the law society than the SLCC is required to apply. Um, the short answer is that I don't know. Uh, the, the provision says what it does. The professional body is the if, if, it, if the judicial factor is a solicitor, the professional body is the law society. Um, I don't think we had any intention of bypassing any other disciplinary or investigative uh, body. Uh, if that's, it would be, I cannot see that there would be any particular problem in, in in doing that, you could say the body includes any other body appointed to investigate professional failures or what have you. Um, but 
professional body in this case would cover a case where the um, judicial factor was an accountant. It would cover a case where the judicial factor was uh, an estate agent, if the estate agents um, get their way. Um, it would cover a, a professional body of any sort if the judicial factor was a member of that body and it was a relevant consideration. Um, if you're asking whether body should be extended in another provision to include any uh, separate disciplinary mechanism, then yes, obviously it could happen. It's not, it's not in the bill at present, but it could very easily, I imagine, be added. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, in response to the committee's call for views, the, the Faculty of Procurators <laughs> of Caithness said that it thought there should be a specific procedure for an interested person or organisation to raise concerns about the judicial factors management of the estate. This, if proposed, would first be to the accountant, and if unsatisfied with the outcome there, would then be a role for the court. What does the Commission think of this as a policy proposal? And uh, and for the benefit of the committee, could you identify uh, any benefits and drawbacks of this proposal? The um, major difference between judicial factors and ordinary trustees, um, and in very many ways a judicial factor is a trustee, but the major difference between a judicial factor and a trustee is that the factor is closely and consistently monitored by the accountant of court. Um, the court appoints a factor to look after the estate. That's what makes him a judicial factor. But that is done under the supervision of the accountant. And so you have a clear responsibility on the accountant to make sure that the factor is operating correctly. Um, I would want, this is pure legal policy, you know, if you want to have a situation in which somebody who complains to the accountant and doesn't like the answer can then go to the court and, and so on up the, up the legal system, you can do that. I personally would want to see evidence that the present system was not working, that there was a case where the accountant had, had demonstrably failed to take account of some obvious defect in the way the factor was operating before I looked for other solutions to it. Um, it is very easy to say, oh, well, you must have a way of fixing this and, and so on. It, it has serious resource implications and serious implications for the um, judgments which factors and accountants have to take uh, if you import a new way of um, attempting to second guess what the system operates, uh, the way the system operates. You could do it, um, but you'd want evidence. Uh, one of the things I used to do before I was a law commissioner was um, get involved in judicial review. And judicial review is essentially where a public body is said not to be operating properly or not, not acting reasonably or what have you. And you used to find that in many areas of the law, a person in a particular position, a judge or a Lord Advocate or a minister or what have you, had a discretion which the courts had always recognised and which they wouldn't interfere with. If X says this is the right thing to do, then we are not going to try and second guess that. And that only lasts until X does something which is so off the wall that something really needs to be done about it. Um, and that has happened in a number of areas of government and local authority operation that yes, X has the discretion, it says so in the statute, and we must let him, mustn't interfere with that until he does something which is so bad that you really have to find a remedy. In this case, I would, as a matter of legal policy, 
as a matter of legal policy, I would want to be persuaded that the accountant had gone so far wrong that um, we really needed a separate way of approaching the matter. And short of that, and there are other ways of raising these things, um, if, if the accountant were, at, were in fact being um, unreasonable and uh, disregarding the serious and genuine complaints, a way would be found of drawing that to the attention of the court. Um, I don't think, barring examples of the accountant not operating properly, I don't think it would be a sensible way to go. But like everything else, it's a matter of policy. If you, if you did it, you could, but um, you would find yourself with the disgruntled character who would never give up, who would go to the accountant, be dissatisfied, go to the court, appeal and so on. And we've seen a number of examples of that in recent years. Okay. Yes, okay. nothing else to say on that. It's, uh, don't, don't go down that road, is, would be my instinct. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and certainly a final question from you, just in terms of, you've said uh, quite a number of things today with regards to the, uh, to the bill as it stands, uh, and also some uh, differences between the bill and the SLC uh, report. Um, do you have any final comments uh, or considerations on the views expressed by, uh, some, by the stakeholders uh, in relation to the bill in front of us? No, um, I think that we were, we were finished with it. We were functus. Our role had come to an end when we produced the report and the draft bill. Um, we have always accepted that the actual content of a draft bill was for the government because they are responsible for promoting the legislation and um, they will make changes for reasons which were not open to us to consider and they are perfectly well able to explain those reasons and defend them when they produce the bill to Parliament. It's then for Parliament to decide, and they have a separate view on the matter, what they are prepared to pass. As I said earlier, bills are made to pass as razors are made to sell. If the bill does, doesn't do the things that you want it to do, or it does things you don't want it to do, you have the ultimate uh, voice in the matter. The Law Commission is very far back than the, the food chain and we are satisfied with the, um, the preparation work that we did and we are very uh, grateful that, that the government has chosen to put the bill before Parliament and we are grateful that Parliament is taking the time to consider it and we earnestly hope that um, it will be passed in more or less its current shape because we think that will produce a, a better institution to serve uh, the people of Scotland. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for that, uh, Patrick. Um, colleagues, do you have any further questions? No. Okay. Uh, Patrick and Charles, do you have any final comments you'd like to make? I don't. Thank you, Commissioner. No. Okay. Well, so, so, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, can I thank both uh, Patrick and Charles for their helpful evidence uh, this morning? Uh, the committee uh, may follow up by letter with any additional questions that stem from the meeting. And of course, if you wish to add anything after the meeting, uh, you are most welcome to do so. Uh, please do so in writing. So with that, thank you very much once again. And with that, I will now suspend the meeting briefly <coughs> to allow witnesses to leave the room. Thank you.
Under agenda item number four, we're considering instruments subject to the affirmative procedure. No points have been raised on the draft Sea Fisheries Remote Electronic Monitoring and Regulation of Scallop Fishing, Scotland Regulations 2024, and the draft Transport Partnerships, Transfer of Functions, Scotland Order 2024. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yeah. Under agenda item number five, we are considering an instrument subject to the negative procedure. An issue has been raised on SSI 2024-101, the Scottish Local Government Elections Amendment, Denmark Regulations 2024. <coughs> the instrument amends the Local Government Scotland Act 1973 to add Denmark to the list of countries whose citizens are eligible to stand for election as members of a local authority in Scotland if they have leave or to enter or remain in the UK. Under Section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010, instruments subject to the negative procedure must be laid at least 28 days before they come into force, not counting recess periods of more than four days. <coughs> the instrument breaches this requirement as it was laid on the 26th of March 2024 and comes into force on the 7th of May 2024. In correspondence with the presenting officer, the Scottish Government explained that this breach had occurred as it could not lawfully make regulations to implement the treaty until after the UK Parliament completed its scrutiny process, which ended on the 25th of March. The treaty is expected to come into force on the 7th of May, at which point the provision in the instrument must be in place to comply with the UK's international obligations. As the instrument has not been laid at least 20, 28 counting days before it came into force as required by Section 28.2 of the 2010 Act, does the committee wish to draw this instrument to the attention of the Parliament under reporting ground J for failure to comply with lane requirements? Yes. And is the committee uh, content with the Scottish Government's explanation provided for this breach of the lane requirements? Yes. Okay, thank you. Under agenda item number six, we are considering instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised on SSIs 2024, 84 and 87. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yeah. Thank you. And with that, I'll move the committee into private.